The following interview was conducted with James L. Ulrichs, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, April 26, 2011 at his home in West Lafayette. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, and I thank you very kindly. Well, thank so, you for coming. I don't know whether I'm going to like this uh, or not. I think you'll do fine. Um, tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in early years and also high school. Oh, okay. Well, my, my grandparents were all immigrants. And so my parents were first-generation people in this country, and, and they didn't get much education. My father, well, he lost his mother when he was six. She was birthing her 10th child or 11th. And uh, so he dropped out of school in sixth grade. And uh, my mother didn't get to go to high school because her grandmother was an immigrant lady. And uh, as they said in the family, she, was, uh, she had gone kind of itsly. <laughs> her mind had given up and somebody had to watch grandma. And so every other month, that was my grandma's job and my mother did it for grandma because she was too busy. And so my parents had very little education, but they were very, very special people. Uh, they got married in 1927, when finally, these families were big, you know, they, uh, even the immigrants who came over had big families. I, in Germany, I could understand it, and I think in this country too. You know, <laughs> they didn't have electricity. They lived in an old house. Uh, they didn't have central heating or anything. So, <laughs> and uh, nights were long. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and so every second year, they had a baby, whether they needed one or not. <laughs> <laughs> Kept the production going, right? <laughs> and uh, then, what do you do with them? And that was the problem. My father had to uh, had to. Uh, wait until he was 20. He worked at all sorts of odd jobs and many things, but he had to wait till he was, till nine, he was 20, he was 28, I suppose, when he got, could get married because one old bachelor farmer uh, had his eye on him and said he'd like him to, he wanted to move to town, I'd like you to in my farm. So they got this old farmhouse and the farm where we lived and that's where we grew up in cold bedrooms and everything too as kids and, and uh, with pretty slim pickings. And, and what was the other part of that question? Oh, uh, then uh, your early years and then talk about high school. And where oh, about, okay. Whereabouts were you living? And were you we were living out in Iowa okay. in the flat country. My immigrant Grandparents were from the marshland, like the Netherlands, okay. but uh, in Germany, actually, right next to there. And so they knew how to deal with wet soils and, and dig tile ditches. And so then my, what was the next part of the question? About early school and then about high school. Early school, yeah. well, Grade it was school? the era of the country school, and every four sections had a school in the middle there and so you walked to that school every morning i'd walk a mile and home as a little boy even and for eight years and you know it wasn't really a very good school we had girl teachers i think most of the time were there two classes in one room or did you have or there were eight classes in one room. okay so you had eight grades there was there. only one room oh <coughs> and uh Interesting. And the bathrooms were two of them <laughs> out, out in the way. And so, uh, and so you can see the teacher taught us first graders. There were three of us. Later there were four. <clears throat> and she'd teach us. And she couldn't have given us more than 30 minutes or so. Sure. And then the second graders would go up and so on. And, and uh, it was pretty thin. I bet, yeah. Uh, my mother said we had a good teacher, a man teacher, when when I first went to school. He was a uh, he he had gotten tuberculosis, and so he had a good teacher, Mr. Egley. Mm -hmm. He was a Mennonite man, and 
I said it was very good. And the last year we had uh, this other one. She was very special. It was the first time she came immediately, she started coming to school every Monday with an armful of books. She knew where the county library was, and she'd bring a big armful of books, and she didn't really f make you read them, but for every one you read, you got your X on, uh, on her chart. Oh, nice. And that was the first real positive thing about school. <laughs> we had a Victrola, but we only had four records. <laughs> so that was school. So you, you really yeah, you got know. some of the amenities there. You didn't really know too much when you went off to high school. Well, where was high school? Close or into town? or? Well, we were between three little towns. Okay. And one was five miles away, and one was six miles away, and one was eight miles away. And of course, we went to the one that was eight miles away <laughs> because... And I asked my mother why, 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 and she said, well, because they had a bus, and they would come, that was the end of the line then. So for the next four years, I still had to walk that mile to, to get to the bus, to get, the, get the bus, right. and walk home, rain or snow or hail or what. So that was my start in life, and it was really poor. But the thing that was important were several of the high school teacher, just a couple who were good. And one was special because he taught differently. And he would, uh, you'd come into, into class, he would have given you a problem before, and he had a library there, and you could work on it whenever you wanted. But when you came into class, you had to be ready to get up and, and, and not only hand in what you had decided was the solution to the problems he was presenting with you, but you, he'd call on you to get up, you and then maybe somebody else you didn't know who, about three or four of us, and then discuss it a little bit. Then he'd give us a new problem, and then we'd go to the books, you know. And an hour in, in a high school class with a teacher droning on is misery and, you know, 15, 20 minutes with this, 15, 20 minutes with that, 15, 20 minutes sure. with that. And it was all exciting. And the things he had to teach us were real. And we went home to the farm and we had to have a project going at home. Right. And so he instilled some goody, good uh, things into you, studying. And that's, yeah. you see, then why I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't even know about college or sure. anything of that sort. I hadn't even thought about it, but my father, I found out, was worried about it. <clears throat> he had, he ended up with four kids, and he was a tenant farmer, and so half the crop goes to the landlord. What are you going to do with those kids? Why do you move? You can't fix them up with a farm. You can't. And I didn't know he was worried about that, <laughs> but uh, because of that teacher, there were a couple other good ones. There that taught a little differently, but they, they were still good. Uh, because of that teacher, then I got interested in maybe doing some, being like him. And, uh, and the other thing that caused that to happen was working for the wrong guy, <laughs> because my Uncle Bill <laughs> came over, he had a chance to rent another 80 next to his farm, all of a sudden, late in the season, when it was almost too late to plant corn. And if he could talk my dad into letting me come and drive the tractor and, 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 and prepare the ground, uh, then, then, we would, uh, then he could do that. And my dad didn't like me working for Uncle Bill. But he came back again, and finally he let me go at 16, and I went and Never had driven a tractor, and he had these great big John Deere D's, you know. I mean, the B's were the little ones, and, but the D's were the big ones. Darn near killed myself a couple of times I working did. for him. Yeah. And he paid, but he paid me five dollars a day. Very good. Saturday I got, Saturday night I got thirty dollars and a free ride home. <laughs> Can't beat that. And uh, then so I decided I wanted to go be like Steve, the ag teacher. And, uh, and you, yeah. went to, you went to Iowa State then? Went to yeah. Iowa State. How did you uh, uh, 
Um, did you live there on campus when you were there? Well, I was too poor for that. Okay. <laughs> I, lived, I found a, a shared attic room okay. across the little river uh, where I shared with another farm kid. For, for what was campus like? Did you, did you enjoy it? What was your major? Well, I majored in ag education because okay. uh, I was going to be a guy like Steve. Okay. And, uh, well, the thing that happened was I got to go to campus for a church event. That, that church held their national meeting there during the summer of kids. And I got to see the place and got to go up all the steps up to the building, you know, where the administration was to, to timidly ask them whether they, I'd been accepted or not. <laughs> and I found out I had, and uh, that's how I got started there. But then the thing that was difficult in the universities, and I'm sure it was here too, was it was fine that year when I was still in high school, but that's when the war ended. And the boys all got GI Bill. And so they went from 5,000 in the spring to 10,000 in the fall. Okay. Yeah. And so, but that had both a wonderful side to it. And that was we were mixed in with these GIs who'd seen the world, knew a lot. And so it was really wonderful to have a few of those guys for friends right. because they kept us moving. And, uh, and they were, I've heard that from others, they, they needed to finish and get on with their life because it had been interrupted and they were really, many of them had families, so they were motivated. They motivated a lot of people. I think a lot of them did. There were a few. Oh, yeah. That, but, uh, but, but they they really did and they knew a lot. Sure. Sometimes more than the professors. Right. And the uh, university was kind of thin on professors because they had grad students teaching and this sort of thing. Right. But they were... They were the other thing that helped me very much. Mm -hmm. When I finished, we were finishing, and they said, "Well, now you got to get out and, and interview around to see if you can get a teaching job." Oh, I thought about that, <laughs> and uh, then then I realized I didn't even have a car, <laughs> and so I went around to all the sort of junkyards of the car lots. Uh, to find a car I could afford. I got one for $100. <laughs> what kind of car do you remember you got? It was a little Ford. Little, well, good for you. And, uh, and it runs. <laughs> and Well, it did for a while. <laughs> it ran enough to take me way over, oh, a hundred and some miles, you know, to interview at a school, and I got the job. And then it even did more than that for me, because then I came back, I had a job, and I had the car, too. And... Uh, Graduate students suddenly, you, and, I, and then I had the summer free because I had a job already. But Starting it didn't in the start fall. fall. Uh -huh. And so that was neat. And uh, so I went to summer school. And a gal I knew, uh, was, was friends with, uh, uh, she had to go to summer school because uh, she was behind. She had various things that had caused her program to be behind, and she was pretty hard up for money, too. And so we spent the summer courting <laughs> and uh, going to school, and, and then I got a teaching job, and she had to stay another semester, and I went way over to Western Iowa to a teaching job with my little old car and uh, got back to see her a couple of times. And then I got my call for the, for the Korean War. Let me ask you this, interrupting or going back, what was uh, living during the war? Uh, was it a problem with your, for your family or were things okay? Cause it was well, we were had... too, uh, might have been a problem as far as the folks were concerned, but not, Okay. Really, because uh, uh, we had food on the farm. Okay. We always had food to eat. And, uh, you had we, we, there was we didn't have too. electricity because we couldn't afford it sure. to have it. And so you didn't have much connection with right. the world. You were isolated out in the cornfield. You Did know. you have telephone service, though? You had telephone. Okay. The old kind where yeah. you rang it and 
three longs and a short. <laughs> My mother told me that during it, sometimes it was hard to get a uh, phone upstairs and downstairs. You were lucky to get, you know, have one oh, phone. Yeah, so you wouldn't have two phones. No yeah, way. right. No and way. she said we would have liked it. <laughs> and it was a multiple party line. <laughs> And my mother's favorite story was calling her mother and talking to her. <laughs> and she said to her mother, oh, I hear your wash machine, you're washing it. <laughs> and, and her mother said, oh, no, that's probably Mrs. Hornsey. <laughs> so Mrs. Yeah, Hornsey you miss a lot of those little phone. things, right? <laughs> oh. Well, then after, te when, when did you start, then you went on to, uh, you stayed teaching for a while, and when did, then you came, ultimately came to play? Well, I just got into my second semester of teaching and then the army caught me for the Korean War. Okay. I'd had a G I'd had a draft card before but I it was fizzling out when high school fizzled out, you know, and uh, they never called me in. So then I had to go. But then was when a little something sometimes really is wonderful. I had trained to be a teacher. I'd been a teacher if only a semester and a, and a month or something. But the guys in the Army, when they s were looking for people to put into the headquarters unit of this, it was a Minnesota, North Dakota National Guard unit that had been activated, and they were down in Alabama, and, and they needed people for different positions. And this captain in there saw that I'd been a teacher and this sort of thing, and he figured I could type, and so he I want him, <laughs> and because of that, I never had to go. You stayed the whole time here in the to, states. To, yeah. Were you staying at the same base too? Yes. Uh, well, it was good. So that was special. I had a chance to go other places, but uh, I stayed there. And uh, okay. How yeah. long were you in for? A couple of years? Did you? How long did yeah, you have to serve? Two years. Two years. Okay. Two years, and it was quite an education because. We were a mixture of kids out of the Midwest, like this, farm kids from around here in, in Iowa, and kids off the street of streets of Jersey in New York City. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and what, what, what? We learned a lot <laughs> listening to those characters. <laughs> they, we would, when you're insecure, you don't say anything. You just look and not those. <laughs> the more insecure they are, the more they talk. And first, <laughs> first night, about drove us nuts. Interesting. What came then after you got out of the service? Where did you did you end up marrying the gal that you? Um, I did. Met in school. Okay. She wouldn't marry me because okay. uh, uh, she owed her grandpa money, and she wasn't through school yet, and so she was going to get a teaching job and and work to pay off her grandpa. And that was fine, I was in the army. And it turned out, out before I had left, uh, she got the teaching job in the school next to mine, way out there in Western Iowa, <laughs> near oh Sioux my. City. And so that was nice. And, and later in my training, military training, I got sent to Nebraska once to, uh, to a camp there for some special training and, and I, had weekends free, <laughs> and uh, so fin finally, when I was about to get out, why she sort of had her grandpa paid back, and we got married, and she came then and lived outside of an arm army camp, you know, as an army wife, and that was a special experience too. I bet. Yeah. But I lost that girl. Uh, we had four kids and the, and the pickup gal we got down in, in the south. And uh, we lost her in 02. And uh, so that was the mother of, of my family. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Well, talk, let's talk a little about, talk about Purdue and how you did your graduate work here. How did that come about? It came about because when I left the army, I knew Purdue was a for some. Were you reason. eligible for? Did you get the GI Bill? Were you eligible for that? Yeah, for I, the was, I was. Yeah. Okay. And I uh, thought maybe I'd like to come to Purdue, 
And so on the way back from the army, we were married, we had a car, and we <coughs> drove through here, and I remember parking on what's now the mall, you know, there you used to could park along there, right. and walking across to the old ag hall there, and they sent me up to the second floor to talk to Stan Barber. And uh, it was off season, see it was in the s early spring of the year, and he said, well, we just don't have anything. But, but then he, he gave me some good advice. He says, why don't you go to Iowa? That's your home state. You, tuition will be much, much less there for you, and you got the GI Bill, and then you can come here if you want for graduate school or for, for uh, advanced degree or something. You can always come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I did. I, okay. Then you ultimately came back to Purdue, and did, did you do your master's here as well as a PhD at Purdue? I have to master's? think about that. I did my master's at Iowa State okay. when I got back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, then I came here. Mm -hmm. And J.B. Peterson was department head here. And that was the best move, one of the best moves I made because he was a very good administrator of people in the department. And he was the head for a long time. He was the head for a long time. 48 to 71. Yeah. And he uh, he turned me loose. <laughs> First, uh, I wasn't coming here because I'd applied at Illinois and North Carolina too. And North Carolina I didn't hear from, but Illinois was offering $125 a month. For a grad student <laughs> subsidy, <laughs> and Purdue was only a hundred and fifteen or something like that. It was ten dollars different. And for ten dollars, I was going to go to Illinois, and I got a phone call from him, and he had, was looking for somebody to work as his <laughs> gopher guy with him in the main office on things, and uh, he'd seen that what my background was, and he just sure. He, he really, amazing man, he, he came out to a meeting out there before I'd left there and Did before he'd, before he'd given uh, uh, a, a go on me and check it through with those different professors that I'd been working with, you know, to <laughs> case me out, be sure he wasn't getting the dud, I guess. So I worked with him for a while, and then as they needed teaching staff, I moved into the teaching. And okay. And your uh, let's talk. Your specialty is um, soils and soil chemistry. That was my specialty. Right. I've been away from it so long now. <laughs> That's not bad. Uh, talk about the auto tutorial, though. How you incorporated it, put that into your. Well, I think I started learning that sort of thing when I was with that high school ag okay. teacher. That sitting and t standing and talking to people for an hour and trying to it is difficult and that's one place i think purdue made a few mistakes when in those early days and it wasn't their fault but like in lily hall they it was a new building they didn't build the classrooms for the number of students they were going to have and when i taught i'd like to be where i could come and talk to you and with the whole room around, I didn't want to have to stand up in front. I can bring specimens and all sorts of things to, sure. to write in front of you, and we could talk and, and around. And, uh, but anyway, that's where I started. And, uh, it was, uh, and the students was, seemed to like it, too? Did they oh really yes. enjoy it? We, 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 I think it was... I, I worry about students nowadays, but... Uh, I think just standing up in front of people and talking to them for an hour might go once, <laughs> but then two days later, another time you do it, and another time you do it, and another, and it it didn't fit my mode. I had to show and tell and be interactive, be interactive, right, yeah. and be interactive nose to nose, sort of, you know. And uh, so you're really helping them one on one almost. That's right. Even in the midst of sure. others, know, right. of others exactly. you know, you could still walk amongst them. That's right. Exactly. And yeah. now I see that some of those same rooms are too small 
and uh, you know if you have a class in there they put extra chairs in sure. well now you can't walk amongst them and um, talk a couple things that um, the Fulbright Hayes Award and then you know, the Portugal uh, University Institute's Development Project that you well, were involved with. Well, the Fulbright was, I, I was eligible for sabbatical leave so I could go and study or work some other place for a year. Sure. And uh, we had had a student from Spain here in our department and I w we were working on the same kind of things, interest in the same kind of things. And his boss there was in Spain was one of the international experts on what we were working on. And uh, they happened to have a professional meeting out there. So we went. <laughs> and, uh, and my mentor here uh, saw to it that I got to meet this guy and that he got to meet me and talk to me and uh, what I and so I told him what I was interested in and I was had applied for a Fulbright and I was hoping I could get a Fulbright I would get one and then I could afford to because I had a wife and a couple of kids and he uh, said, said as we left well he he thought that I might be able to work that work that out <laughs> Uh, he, he kind of, on an aside, said he was on the Fulbright Committee there in Spain. <laughs> so it wasn't quite honorable, I don't think, but I did get uh, I know to spend nothing. a year there. <laughs> that was good because I got uh, some competency in Spanish in addition to doing... Whereabouts in Spain were you in... In, uh, in Madrid. In Madrid, okay. They had a their national research lab there, and, and I got to be there. It was quite an education for me, and it was nice for my family. Oh yeah, because the children got to go to school there. Right. The boys, well, the one boy was two already. Well, I can, I'm trying to think. No, they were both there. Anyway, one, uh, they had a s military school outside at an air base, and they would come into town with the bus and pick up American kids that wanted to go out there and so got two of my kids were there one was away from home already and uh, the little one we put her in uh, they had an Eng the Spanish had an English school and we knew we couldn't get her in everybody wanted their kids in that you know well we went over and saw oh they were so glad to get her because they wanted somebody who really spoke English, you know, <laughs> as part of their school. And so the little one got to go, oh, that's nice. got to, go to school there. Did you, sp did you spend much time at the Prado, at the museum? We, we spent time there. Uh, I've been to Madrid. It's been a long time. And I yeah. just, I love the Spanish artists anyway, you know. And I, I visit Toledo. And also, there's that... The El Greco that's at the museum, the New York Museum, Museum of Art, the crucifixion, and I remember mm -hmm. seeing it. There was always some. They have a couch in front of it. There's always somebody just sitting there watching it. And when I went to Toledo and knowing the spot where yeah. you could really see it, so it was kind of a treat. Yeah, my wife was into that more than I was, but we spent time. Oh, that's well, joy and, and when you're in that kind of a setting, you know, when you're here, I was so involved with my work I, sure. I, I didn't take time to do the sort of things here even if they had been here but uh, there the place was locked up on weekends yeah, you got know. a little bit of chance there right? yeah. the um, Portugal uh, the Villa Real tell us about that well that was kind of a, uh, a natural happening I can't remember where that was in, sure. in life Exactly, but uh, having worked in Spain and Spanish being a lot like Portuguese made it somewhat of a natural uh, because you couldn't go unless you could pass a test that yeah. <laughs> said you could you could huh. read read and speak some Portuguese, and I had to go to Washington <laughs> to prove that. And I think I passed by the skin of my teeth, but uh, that was 
after the dictator was gone. In Portugal? In Portugal. Okay. And they were trying to do some new things. And the north east corner of Portugal was kind of isolated way up there. Uh, a lot of wonderful vineyard country mm -hmm. there, but there's also a lot of just extreme poverty and uh, villages that were so poor. And, uh, and they wanted, they were starting to head start of the university up there, or college, they call them university. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted somebody there. They didn't have anything, and they were sort of starting one up there in that, in that, that area? Yeah, this was a new start. Okay. Or something. Is that, is that Villarreal? That's in Villarreal. Oh, okay. Villarreal, yeah. Up, and it was quite a. We had to go for two years, and we had to sort of abandon our kids. But most of them were ready to be abandoned anyway, and one of them we farmed out so she could finish high school. And, and that was a good year, I, and we got a lot of those young faculty there to come over here for short stays too, and uh, I think we were helping was, them. Was uh, the buildings constructed? I mean, the school was up and running at that That's time? That's right. Oh, okay. They put in a fair number of new buildings. Okay. I think they well, had some old buildings. I don't know if they belonged to school before or if they, what they had there early on for school. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's changed again now. Uh, so much in life changes by happenstance and you don't have any control over it. When they became part of the European Union, the European Union thought, well, we better have a good highway scooting down through Portugal, down to Madrid. And uh, that went right through that corner there, you know. Well, you know, the old farmers that were having a hard time making a living, and others like them, found out very fast they could get on the job pouring cement or doing something with the highway com that was coming down through there, and they abandoned their non-profitable farming and this sort of thing. And so it's been a kind of a mixed blessing, but of course up in that area is where the great port wine country is, and, mm -hmm. and that too is, uh, and we worked on some of their uh, nutrition problems they had with uh, wine plants, a lot of fascinating things. They, uh, farmers would plant potatoes between their vine rows, because potatoes are early, they could get a potato crop and then have the vineyard. Sure. And then they were starting to see that there were places where this vine and maybe this one and not all of them, but they were sick. And uh, we found that they, I'm forgetting all of these things, but we, we finally, it took us a year and a half to figure it out that they were putting the fertilizer that their potatoes needed on abundantly, so they got good potatoes, but it was causing necrosis problems in, the, the, vine. in the, vines. the vines. And so uh, we, that was one of the things we, we worked through. And, and uh, <laughs> it was a lot, of, a lot of practical and interesting problems. Yeah. What the, where the students come from, just from around there, and was it primarily an agricultural uh, college? It or? was at that time. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, think time, times have changed, okay. like, like I was telling you. And, yeah. And uh, so they... But initially it was primarily still, agriculture? Yeah. yeah, I think more than anything. Okay. Yeah. You know, and they were trying to get good people in the different areas of agriculture, and, and they certainly needed it there, but it was difficult to deal with because the rural people had so little money. And uh, it, it was, I think, quite successful. And uh, it's changed now oh, sure. because the Portuguese have, have a different mentality now that the super highways coming through and and these sorts of things, and I think it's more oriented toward the, there's some big vineyards up there and that sort of thing, and I don't know what else I would be yeah. back in recent time.
Um, you make a comment on Lars for the researchers that you know a little bit about Lars. You said that. I did, but I don't really. Oh, did you have any contact uh, <coughs> contact with him at all, or not? No, I wasn't or? working okay. in that area. All my son John. Uh, Originally, they were out at the research park, weren't they? Located out there at the research park. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's right. And uh, my son John would go out there and work in. I married again. Okay. Uh, married Susan. Her, she and her husband, Jack Axtell, he was a, one of our stellar plant geneticists. We're friends of ours. And she lost Jack. And then in more recent time than that, then I lost my wife. And uh, Very nice. One day, I, <laughs> one day I noticed her, <laughs> and after a while... But anyway, uh, their daughter too, I think, worked out at Lars somewhere okay. as, when they were students. Okay. And uh, my son John did, and now uh, he's coming home tomorrow. I think, what, is, what day are we? No, he's coming home this weekend. We'll have a mere day. But he's now uh, working with a German company in Brandenburg, Germany. The company that sent a satellite up, a Russian satellite, <laughs> we tell them, yeah, they took the nuke off the top and sold it to them. <laughs> and uh, they had the rocket. And they put five satellites on it. And it went up and then they all made polar or make polar orbit, but each one at a different angle, so that in the course of a day or two, they've seen the whole world. And uh, he's he's peddling that around the world, and trying to get places set up now in Africa and in India and South America. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't. I'll find out. How I You'll pour one right up, right? Well, that brings up the family. You have, uh, you want a couple children? Did any of them come to? Did they go to Purdue or? Do you have children? Yeah, I have to There's, think about that. Uh, do you have two, what, two boys and a girl, or? Two boys and two girls. Oh, okay. <coughs> John uh, got his degree here and got got a PhD here, I guess. Uh huh. And Carl <laughs> struggled to get through because he had too many other priorities. <laughs> but he, I think he actually got his degree from Purdue. No, he didn't in the end, but he went out in the work day world and then uh, he realized he needed to get that degree and he got it at one of the smaller colleges over in eastern Indiana, I can't remember which one. Mm -hmm. He got a bachelor's degree, John got his PhD. Mm -hmm. And my girls, uh, Christy wanted to break loose I don't know what she was. She was in college. She'd gone to IU for a year or two. She wanted to go to Alaska. <laughs> and uh, you don't get home on weekends when you go to Alaska. Her <laughs> mother made a deal with her on that. I forget what the deal was, but she had <laughs> she had to get her degree, and she did. And she she, she was living pretty thin up there for a while, but uh, oh, she did go to Alaska. Oh, she went. Yeah, to school up there. Yeah, she went up there to finish the schooling. Uh, she was not an IU type. Uh, anyway, uh, and she's still there. Yeah, she met a boy there. He's the head of the art department there, and she's got. We're about to live in, in Fairbanks. Or? In Fairbanks. Uh -huh. Yeah. This far from the, this far from the Arctic Circle. <laughs> And not hot up there. <laughs> not hot up there, no. And uh, then the little one uh, was a little difficult to get through school, too. She went out west, and she uh, finally got her college degree at Western Washington, I think it is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, I forget which one it is. We went there for a graduation and uh, married a boy from that part of the world and, and works out of uh, the little town of Titan. 
uh, on this side of Mount Rainier down in the Apple Country. Sure. And she was a significant teacher in a, in a pretty pretty nice high school. Mm-hmm. And great, I, grade school, I think more grade school than high school, but upper grades and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, fortunately, you see, she lived with us in Spain and things. And she can talk Spanish. <laughs> and <laughs> she, she had to go around, you know, to, well, who picks apples? Sure. They aren't. <laughs> And uh, so there were a lot of Spanish families around. The kids come to school, you know, and they don't know necessarily very much English. And then they have parent-child conferences, you know, or she goes out to the home and visits them, and, and uh, <laughs> she has, she she has quite a quite a bit of fun with these kids. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get them to admit to their mother <laughs> in Spanish, and then then they they can't get by with anything because she hear she knows what they say. Right, I hear you. Um, awards and honors. Um, you're in the you know, book of great teachers. I am. Yep, I think oh, so. Okay. Right, and uh, the, you got the Rich L. Cole's outstanding undergraduate teacher, the old the Murphy Awards. That that sounds That's like nice. that sort of Very thing. Nice. Yeah. And uh, from the Soil Science Society, American, American Education Award. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, yeah. What about hobbies? Special interests, I mean, hobbies that you have? Oh, I don't know. I'm too old for hobbies. <laughs> well, you know, take care of the garden. Okay. I spend a lot of time with my kids uh, working on things, fixing things. Good. You know? I mean, because that. Do some of them live close is, by? Huh? They don't live close by, though, do they? Nobody lives close okay. by. Okay. Yeah. We got one in Indy. Okay. But uh, I taught them to... Wait, we didn't have any money, even when through all of this, you know, early on. We didn't have any money. And uh, we lived way out in the country in a rented house. J.B. Peterson had bought some land out there that had an old house on it. And that was fine, but... Uh, our eldest was going to start was starting school out at Battleground, and the bus driver was a wild cahoot, and, and uh, Christina wouldn't uh, decide we had to move to town, <laughs> and so we bought an old junker house by campus, right across from where Vaughn's used to be, uh, on uh, let's see, one street down from what's the name of that street? Pierce Street. Pierce. You mean near the in the village? Yeah, in the village, you know where Vaughn's is now. Sure. Okay. Vaughn's used to be oh. at the at the south end of that alley. If you take the alley, right at the south end, the house on this side was Vaughn's, and that's where he started his book oh. score stuff. I, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't realize and, that. And we bought an old j- junker house just across oh, from it. Oh, okay. Some old lady, the kids finally talked her to come and live with them, and uh, she had. <laughs> Rented it to one, two, three. She maybe had four foreign students up in there, and uh, so we had some interesting experiences and, and a lot of carpentry work and things that sure. kids needed to learn. And that's the kind of thing I would have learned on the farm, you see. And, and uh, they even bought a house once. Car- Carl was working for the city here in inspection, I think, work there while he was a student in the summer. And uh, there was a house for sale along Salisbury, and uh, it looked pretty sad. And, and we were leaving town, and I sent him down to see Ted X and the banker <laughs> and buy the house. <laughs> and I helped him, you know, teach him how to do all the things, and so sure. we, we did a lot of that sort of thing. And uh, of course, with Susan, she, her focus is different. She she paints, and she's great on yard and garden and that sort of thing. And so I like to work on those things. And I mostly look for things that need doing. I work with uh, Lutheran World Relief uh, when World War. Uh, 
in World War II times, all of the Northern Hemisphere was practically destroyed by those, what, four or five dumb dictators. And so Lutheran World Relief started making, uh, they call them quilts, but they're really tied comforters for those people. And uh, did it all over the country. Now, they're all, hey, all the southern hemisphere and these little islands and Haiti and places are, are in destitution. And so we make quilts from free fabric. They're pretty well free fabric. You know, fabric you can get sheets and sure. bread spreads and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so I've gotten into that. Sounds good. <laughs> and yeah. I, I can go down to the church basement in the morning and lay out, pin, tie, and, and sometimes sew a quilt. Oh, good. I can do do one in part of a morning, you know, sure. so I do a lot of that. And, and uh, transitional housing here in town, I try and work with them with uh, the stuff they need. Good. Because we don't need anything. And, and uh, It's nice to be able to share. But I'm not doing anything. I, see, I don't fit in your scheme of things here, really, because once I retired, I backed out of practically all the scientific professional work, the teaching work, and uh, doing other things. Doing other things. Right. Okay. And How about a Purdue tradition? Do you have a tradition? No. You know, okay. no. Sometimes people do the Boilermaker special, or mm -hmm. a couple people have shared with me commencement was, you mm -hmm. know, sort of nice. So I, I never I, was a committee person and that sort of thing, and I never. Did you ever go to what about athletics? Did you used to go I to never, games? Football or basketball? Because I didn't. I never got to do it as a, as a, in my earlier life. Then I didn't have any money and couldn't be. <laughs> and uh, so <coughs> when I was a grad student and stuff here, well, I went to a few basketball games. And sure. But, but, but unless like you're really going to go, you, you don't know the players. And so I, right. I just... And there's also a lot of games too. Right. And there's so many. It's yeah. just... That's it. In um, closing... The academic agronomist, do you look at it in the, uh, some co comments on that in the, 20, the first decades of the 21st century? Oh, in the first decades of the 21st century? Yeah. Well, it's changed so much. And okay. It's become extreme. Well, when I was coming in, we were just getting into the stage where we had instrumental background for the work we were trying to do. We had the x-ray and the and the, all the inst instrumentation we started to get. But we couldn't look at the little things, you know, the wiggly on a, on a gene sure. uh, thing and all of this. And, and I see that's a real change. It's all into that kind of more meticulous, very fine science and very complicated and... Uh, I couldn't go back in and survive. <laughs> and it made, it's making an impact. Is it making an impact on the field itself? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. But it overlaps so much. It's not just. Sure. But uh, we get more uh, toot on it from the medical end. You know, everybody's all. In, yeah. We're all sort of sickly some way or another and we're all interested in it from the medical end which is uh, pretty high powered stuff and you got it dealing with people but a lot of these things of course apply to all the plants and the animals and things that we work with right. and especially all this genetic stuff and modification and right. uh, it's, it's made a tremendous difference and that's when I was a Kid, uh, the average corn yield in Iowa and Illinois and Indiana was 30 bushel per acre per year. Now everybody's trying to got got 200 and wondering how far they can go beyond that. You know, almost a tenfold increase. Right. And uh, it's a lot of it's genetic and a lot of it's. Uh, Things having to do with all sorts of aspects of nutrition and, right. and other things. Anything I forgot to ask, or anything oh. you want in closing? 
<laughs> Anything in closing? Oh, I, I think we, I was, I was. We appreciate. I was kind of a waste of your time, but. No, I, I really enjoyed it, and it was because, very helpful to me. Because I didn't. Um, uh, I backed out and went to other things well, when I retired. You covered a lot of things, and we really and, appreciate that. And since my kids went to the four corners of the globe, you know, just going to see your kids and stuff <laughs> once in a right. while is, is uh, Thank you very much.